Hello everyone, we're back for episode 6 of the Wavy Dynamics Insight series. Again, I'm joined by Mike, who is offering his expertise and time in explaining another topic. Today we're going to cover RIDE, and um, also sometimes known as Vertical Dynamics. That's a, quite a broad subject, but very um, salient in race car performance development. So this largely encompasses springs and dampers, body control, unsprung mass control, and um, the, the chassis uh, displacement modes. So we've got heave, roll, pitch, and uh, warp. So we're gonna be getting into those, um, covering the some of the key elements of those and arriving at a ride profile that is favorable for the car's performance in a given scenario. Um, so yeah, why don't we get straight into it? Mike, what's the first thing you wanna to touch on? Yes, good morning. So. As you say, I think the ride is, is sort of synonymous with the vertical dynamics and, and the response of the vehicle because of the inputs from the road. Uh, obviously, as you as you drive around the lap, the, the height of the track is going to vary to a, a greater or lesser extent, uh, and that's going to put different vertical inputs into the car body that you're going to have to deal with and, and sort of uh, spread out in a way that maximizes the, the performance envelope of the car. Uh, I like to think of this in terms of, of linear systems uh, and by that uh, I suppose I mean that the uh, the body is, is vibrating around different modes uh, that are a function of sort of the mass properties and the, the spring stiffnesses that you've got and uh, these these modes are kind of inherent to the to the car itself, uh, kind of separating out to one side for a minute the the inputs from from the road, uh, and and each of these modes have natural frequencies, a bit like a, a piano tuning fork. So if you hit the uh, move the 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 car in a particular way, uh, it's going to bounce at a a certain frequency in one of these modes. Uh, until the, the damping kind of uh, causes that to die away. Uh, and you've already already mentioned some of the modes we're interested in. There's the uh, like the, the body bouncing mode in, in heave, uh, also in, in pitch and roll. Uh, and these are the ones that, that are going to kind of dictate, I guess, our overall uh, ride performance. Uh, we can think of the road as, as like a noise signal uh, input into these modes uh, and the the road contains all of the frequencies uh, that uh, you know across the spectrum they're going to excite the modes that are kind of in inherent in the body of our car uh, and that's uh, that's that's what we're going to see as as the ride behavior we've often I, th I think I've often heard people talking about the road containing more or less of a particular frequency and that's why you see the uh, these modes shapes kind of arise in in the car response but I, my uh, view on that is it's it's pretty unlikely unless it's it's like a curb or a, a rumble strip with like evenly spaced uh, little bumps in it i think it's more likely that the uh, the undulations in in the road surface cover all the frequencies, and but it's only the the frequencies around the natural frequencies of the modes that are appearing in in some of our data. So two things that I just want to focus on from there a little bit. So you mentioned uh, the natural frequencies. So maybe just um, to explain that the natural frequencies are influenced by the spring rates in each of the modes. You have a, 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 a different frequency response I suppose and they're influenced by the stiffnesses in those so um, that as you might have heard us explain in previous episodes there are some conflicting requirements there in um, what's required from the aerodynamic platform which should be a very high nat natural frequency or a stiff spring rate leading to a high natural frequency and um, conversely for um, tire grip or tire load variation, contact patch load variation, which would require a softer spring rate. So you mentioned that you see um, different ride frequencies in the data. How do you usually receive that and how do, how, do you, um, how do you identify what the road input is doing? So your car's probably got a few sensors that will be telling you about the, the ride information that's, that's 
the car is kind of well the the uh, applied dynamics the car is subject to at any one particular time this could be uh, the uh, accelerometers mounted on the body or even on on the hubs uh, you might have uh, load cells in your suspension that that uh, are telling you the uh, the load on that particular corner uh, at any instant in time and uh, you might might even have uh, lasers uh, ride height lasers uh, that that should show some of this frequency content from ride in sort of all of them and by piecing each of those together you'll be able to build up a picture of, of the ride behavior of the car uh, over different points in the lap you know are there some uh, some areas of the lap where where one mode is is more dominant or or maybe the other uh, and again it's about deconstructing these and, and targeting specific areas that you want to focus on uh, that's the key to kind of uh, making improvements uh, over the course of the lap. Yeah, and um, also important to that is, as we'll talk about a bit more later, um, but there's um, there's a component of this frequency response which is directly from the springs and dampers and then also from the tyre as well. So, um, as you mentioned, you can have laser ride height sensors and uh, potentiometers on the damper, so those two bits of information can help you understand um, what's coming from each of the the tire and the springs and that is maybe a nice segue into the next part of this discussion which is about uh, load delivery of the tires and um, keeping a consistent uh, contact patch load there yes yeah, so as for the question question you know why do we want good ride performance uh, you know it's not it's not obvious I think as you're as 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 you see the car driving around the lab and you see the tire contact patch loads varying up and down it's not obvious exactly why uh, you'd want to reduce that in order to to go faster because your your mean uh, vertical load on on each tire is probably pretty similar to what it would be if there wasn't any ride contact uh, ride content i should say uh, but uh, you you'll find with poor ride there'll definitely be a a lap time hit uh, and, and the reason for that, uh, in my view, is that it's difficult for a driver to exploit grip that is varying, especially around the, the ride frequency of the car. Uh, the driver is going to uh, perceive that as, as a, an inconsistency. You know, sometimes the, the rear is going to break away as uh, you kind of get to a trough in your tire, uh, in your axle vertical load. Sometimes the, the front uh, it, 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 uh, is going to kind of push forwards uh, and leave you unable to, to make the corner uh, and because of that the the driver is going to have to uh, drive with a, a greater margin to the ultimate performance of the car because uh, they're not going to be able to rely on that grip being there every time they, they drive around the, a particular corner or uh, or hit a curb. I think there is there's also a, a consistency and a comfort element. It's if uh, the the ride is is terrible going into a particularly challenging braking zone, and so much so that the driver struggles to uh, to see his braking point or see uh, where they need to turn in. Uh, that's going to be that's going to be disturbing. Again, they're going to have to drive with a, a greater margin uh, if they're not able to control the car because the the ride is so bad. So what you're saying about um, the, the kind of uh, the varying grip as you, as you go around the corner, and you, you said the average is roughly uh, consistent between a very bumpy section or well the same corner profile with a, a very bumpy um, road input or a very smooth one. So there will be moments where there's a, a higher load into the tyre and there are moments when they're lower. But yeah, the average grip that you're generating is, is pretty consistent. Do you see um, tire load sensitivity? Does that come into that at all? I think you're right that it does does a little. So obviously the the vertical load sensitivity of the tire is dropping as we add load. So around a peak, we're not going to add as much grip to the tire as we do uh, as we lose in in a in a trough of a vertical load. Uh, but in my experience, that's reasonably second order. Uh, in that, you know, much your when you when you drive around a um, 
a, a particular corner with really good ride, the, the lap time you will gain is, is proportionally greater than that effect would, would suggest. I think it kind of comes down to these other these these two elements about about margins. Uh, the, the whilst uh, the the handling dynamics tend to be at, at lower frequencies than the ride dynamics, there are big enough big enough troughs in your uh, in your contact patch load profile might be enough for the for one axle or the other to just as kind of step out, and you only need that to happen once every uh, ten laps or so. Uh, and overall you've lost time so much more uh, a more robust approach is uh, driving with a with a consistent margin one that kind of respects the the amount of grip that you're going to have because of ride uh, and, uh, and and exploiting that to, to the best of your potential rather than trying to uh, overdrive for the situation and ex we're expecting grip that isn't going to be there all of the time all right um so now uh, that's a bit of an intro into that into ride. Um, so now let's talk about understanding it and quantifying it. Um, so a common tool used for that is the quarter car model, right? That's right. So it's a it's a very simple, probably the simplest ride model for, for a vehicle that you can conceive of. It's it's essentially the model of one corner of a vehicle, uh, where on the top you've got the the body mass. Uh, and that sits on a, a spring damper, which represents the, the suspension of the car. And that is connected to uh, another mass, which is the wheel and the tire. And, and then finally, a, a second spring that connects that wheel and tire mass to the, the road surface. Uh, and this is a, a very simple model that, that actually goes a long way to telling you about uh, the, the most effective ways of improving ride performance. Uh, so. To start with, you can you can describe this as this system as having two modes. The first being the the body bounce mode. That's the uh, the the larger sprung mass bouncing up and down uh, on uh, both the tire and and the road surface uh, beneath it. But then the second mode you've you've also got in this system is is known as wheel hop, where the uh, the mass of the uh, wheel and tire is bouncing kind of between the road surface and the body and that's typically at a much higher frequency because the uh, the unsprung mass is tends to be a lot lower and the you've also got the combined stiffness of the uh, suspension and the tire working in parallel so you see those as a kind of two distinct humps in in your uh, frequency response uh, you know body bounce anywhere between kind of three and maybe nine or ten hertz wheel hop modes probably more like more around 20 hertz and these in this model these are the two modes that are going to uh, uh, going to appear in your data as you go over sort of a, a noisy track surface nine or ten hertz that's uh that's that's pretty high how come it varies so much ah well it, it varies based on the uh, the mass of the um the mass properties of, of the car you're dealing with i guess and also some, some of the some of the stiffnesses nine and ten hertz it, uh, is is very high for kind of heave modes of the car but for for roll and pitch that's that's pretty typical yeah i thought we were talking heave uh, i thought yeah that's a that's a very stiff chassis yeah. <laughs> so I, I think that the model tells you a few things uh it tells you first of all that that uh, increasing unsprung mass is is bad, both for your uh, well for your your contact patch load variation. So the load in in the spring uh, that connects the tire to the road, uh, and this is uh, this is simply because the the wheel has less ability to kind of get out of the way of the the bumps in the road surface. So obviously, as that unsprung mass reduces, uh, it's it's it's. Uh, there's much le less inertia in that system and and the wheel you know can easily uh, get out of the way of, of bumps similarly increasing the sprung mass is 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 good for body control uh, and this means that the the disturbances that you get from the road surface aren't affecting the body motion so much because the, because of the inertia in that system and if you look at uh, ride performance uh, in say a, a Rolls-Royce saloon car uh, or from a, a big SUV 
you can see that the, the, the ride performance is much improved, largely because the, the sprung mass of those vehicles is so heavy in relation to the, the unsprung. Uh, and then low spring stiffness in the suspension is always good. Uh, it, it reduces the transmission from the uh, motion of the unsprung mass into the sprung mass, but it also uh, allows the, the unsprung mass to get out of the way over the bumps. And there's less, less resistance from the body that's, that's keeping that tire kind of pressed hard against the, uh, the bumpy surface. Uh, and then damping is, is less obvious. Uh, it's something that you're going to have to tune uh, to remove as much en energy from that system as quickly as possible in order to get the, the body to settle uh, once you've uh, gone past the bumpy region and now you're just into a, a smooth uh, section of the road. Too little damping is just going to mean that the body, uh, does, the, the whole system doesn't settle and that, that bouncing kind of perpetuates uh, long into, say, a, a smoother section of road. Whereas too much damping is, is, is like too much spring stiffness in that it just prevents the unsprung mass from, from getting out of the way uh, of, of the bumps. Uh, but you, and you also transmit more of that energy from the unsprung mass into the sprung mass. Uh, and that's disturbing for uh, uh, the, uh, the, the body motion at, at any one time. Yeah, and um, we actually had a Q&A question about how to find, um, find the best damping, um, damping rates for each application or each situation. So we can talk about that a little more. And um, so that also applies to pitch and roll modes as well? Absolutely. So it's, it's a similar analogy uh, across the car. So whilst pitch and roll are sort of rotational degrees of freedom rather than, uh, than he, which is translational, uh, it all works out the same, um, all the maths works out the same, you're just using uh, rotational inertia rather than, rather than mass. Uh, you can also set up uh, simple extensions on, on the quarter car model, which is sort of half car models, uh, where you have uh, uh, two sets of suspension and, and tyres, uh, and these kind of combine at the body to, uh, to, to add uh, an additional degree of freedom that's rotational uh, alongside the one that you've already got in heave yeah and it's quite interesting as well um as we just mentioned that the different modes have different frequencies um or different frequencies at which they're they're working optimally for you so um uh yeah logically there's different spring stiffnesses um for, for roll um so there's a roll stiffness value and a heave stiffness value um and that's why um, decoupling is such a, um, a useful tool. So, you know, the anti-roll bar is a, a way of decoupling the, the heave stiffness from the um, roll stiffness, but then also decoupling pitch and, and things like that with third elements is uh, a common practice you see at most um, non-road car based racing, such as Le Mans and, and Formula cars and things like that. So different ways of optimizing the, the response for each of your your displacement modes. Yeah, I think you're right. Certainly if you look at the, the suspension topology inside, uh, let's say, some of the more dedicated um, chassis that you have out there, and you, you spoke, spoke about, you know, hypercar and uh, in Formula cars as well, you tend to, tend to avoid uh, just having corner springs on their own. And it's it's much more convenient to split those in terms of heave and roll. So uh, having a um, having a heave spring that is there to uh, to respond to your uh, heave modes and uh, the vertical loads that you have on the car and the anti roll bar doing doing the opposite in in roll. Uh, if you if you're uh, if you have sort of corner springs corner dampers. You're unable to distinguish at the kind of suspension element between uh, inputs that are coming from heave, uh, uh, so vertically up and down, and any inputs that are coming from roll and pitch, and that makes it more difficult to tune your your kind of damp uh, dampers into a, around a particular mode uh, to sort of optimize those. And you can we uh, you can say the same about springs as well. So 
any uh, any car that's that's able to would would benefit a lot from uh, from splitting out those uh, uh, the the loads in any particular corner in the car into a you know in, uh, into a, a topology that that is more appropriate for the kind of forces that you're going to be reacting uh, from the contact patch and through into the chassis. Yeah. Um, okay. So tools for tuning ride performance. Um, so we've been talking about springs and dampers here so far, and those are ultimately the, the two tools um, that are used to, to vary the, the performance in ride. So springs, um, I guess, would be a first one to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. So so springs are probably the, the, the toughest decision in terms of there's, there's typically a compromise here between uh, very stiff springs, as, as you mentioned, when you want to uh, maintain the aero platform control uh, as closely um, as well as, as closely as you can. Uh, if particularly if your car has has downforce uh, and you know you want to stick at a point in the aero map that delivers the most downforce most of the time. Uh, if if your car doesn't have downforce, there's not really a uh, an important reason to, to have stiff springs. The uh, you you you're not losing you're not bit, uh, you don't care about changing ride height around the lap. So having those springs as soft means you're you're going to get less transmission from the road surface into the chassis of the car uh, by keeping those nice and soft. Uh, you're also going to delay any weight transfer effects through through cornering so whilst uh, you know you start off in a corner and then uh, you, you steer and you start to see that that um, that weight transfer effect building up uh, because of the the relative inertia there'll be a, a a a short period where the the four tires will be sliding but the body isn't in equilibrium uh, and it's it it's taking you know a, a few a few tenths to kind of settle into the corner with soft springs relative to stiff springs that that period kind of grows uh, and it's long takes longer for the uh, the body to settle into the corner and during that phase you're going to find you have uh, more grip from lower weight transfer by by keeping the springs soft so it's uh, it's probably a bit counter to maybe some of the cars, sports cars you see on the road that tend to be sort of sprung quite stiffly. Uh, you you probably slow down the um, kind of reaction times, uh, w w the perceived reaction of the car to those inputs from the driver when you're reducing those spring stiffnesses. But uh, you probably have more grip as an average around the lap by running uh, relatively soft. Yeah, and um, if anyone ever wants to see any of that in action, just have a look at some of the old, um, would it be Good, Goodwood Revival or, you know, some of the old saloon car racing where they you know, you've got like 10 degrees of roll angle and <laughs> oh, I'm sure they look pretty dramatic. Um, yeah, agreed. Stock cars are, are good for, uh, for seeing that sort of behavior. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so on to dampers. Um, dampers are quite interesting. Um because a lot of high performance racing dampers, at least they have um, two distinct responses to different uh, uh, piston speeds, piston input speeds. So you have um, low speed damping, which is more associated with body control. Um, and then also you have high speed damping, which is more related to the unsprung mass and the inputs from the road, right? Yeah, in, in these higher performance dampers, you can adjust those individually. So there's two tools, um, to yeah, two different aspects of damping which you can uh, influence there and um, yeah I guess if you're not so careful to <laughs> two different ways of getting confused yeah so I think my experience with dampers is a little bit atypical compared to um, some of the you know saloon touring car stock car damper tuning that that gets done around the world uh, I'm not really that used to using dampers for, for tuning handling but uh, it is. It's certainly something that, that I know is it gets done around the world. I think as for tuning dampers for ride performance, uh, you, you're 
the the benefits of having I guess low speed and, and high speed adjustment uh, haven't been made uh, well it kind of it kind of depends what speeds you are seeing around the different uh, modes in the lap data that probably influence your decision on on where you're going to uh, focus your attention uh, I guess uh, f uh, f my experience is, is dampers are, are reasonably second order for for controlling ride performance relative to just springs. I think it's it's pretty clear that you need to have dampers to, to stop the car just uh, bouncing uncontrollably for um, uh, for large periods of time. But that the uh, the amount of tuning required to uh, get the dampers in in a reasonable place to uh, improve ride performance is, is reasonably small and that uh, there's the benefits of having a, a sort of non-linear characteristic from um, the uh, low speed and the high speed adjustments let's say is kind of a lower order again than just being able to kind of manipulate the whole curve up and down it kind of as you as you say the uh, uh, you you will have those adjustments and they're they're useful for different things but i suppose what what we what you need to focus on from a sort of ride perspective is just the ability to remove energy from the uh, from the car bouncing when you see it in the data and that will often mean focusing on in on the, the speeds you tend to see but it, unfor unfortunately it can get a bit circular because obviously as you change your damping values around different speeds then uh, the, the the speeds you'll get from the results data will will change alongside those as well. So there's a bit of a circular loop. I think you the important thing is to kind of choose the metric that you're most interested in, be it uh, contact patch load variation or or body bounce for kind of aero platform control, uh, and uh, and hone in your your damping curves uh, around those areas. Uh, just with the aim to, to kind of maximizing performance in in the best way that you see see fit. Yeah. Um, so maybe worth just touching in a general sense on um, the develop different development methods of um, you know, tuning for rides. So you've obviously got simulation, which is a big one. Track testing, so measuring data from you know uh, instrumentation on the car, but also you've got things like um, four and seven poster rigs. And each of those have their advantages and disadvantages. So yeah, lots of different tools at, at, a, um, at an engineer's disposal for that. So um, we've got just a, a last thing to touch on, which is three wheeling. So sometimes you see with cars that have um, very high uh, roll stiffness distribution towards one axle, um, in some cornering situations, you can see one of the wheels lift off the floor. It's a situation that we see come up from time to time when uh, the car that you've provided with four wheels chooses to, to only use three of them uh, around some corner or, or around some areas of warp track. Uh, and as you say, so mechanical balance, uh, roll stiffness distribution is, a, is can be a contributor here. But it's even just, you know, if the road surface is falling away around uh, one particular corner, you might also see this as well. Laguna Seca, perhaps the the corkscrew. Yeah, absolutely. And there's there's plenty of corners in circuits like uh, Monte Carlo, uh, uh, Bathurst, uh, that all you know have have this characteristic of the 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 inside uh, of the track falling away and leaving you know one of your four wheels hanging in the air where it's it's not able to provide any grip. Uh, and the the consequence for for ride performance is that the the car you've tuned to behave well in ride uh, with all four wheels on the ground isn't going to work very well with three and there's uh, you know a lot of ways that this can kind of uh, spiral out of control and you get some you know reasonably extreme looking ride modes that appear in this situation uh, and whilst uh, it's it's clearly possible to re-optimize your your car around this new three wheeling condition uh, I think most vehicle dynamics engineers' experience of this is uh, it's much better to try and avoid three wheeling altogether, uh, and that could mean uh, 
you know, changes to your chassis that negate the need for a, an extreme mechanical balance. Or if this is happening over a, a warp surface, then maybe just a reduction of, of roll and, and warp stiffness on the vehicle. That, that's going to be the thing that, that pays off more uh, in the long run than, you know, trying to balance both this this three wheeling ride uh, versus your, your typical ride where you've got all four wheels on the ground. Okay, um, so just wrapping this one up then, we've got some Q&A from some of our um, community that have been following the videos. So I uh, picked three of them and we'll go over those now. So the first one from Mohammed Musa 948 who also ha had a question on one of the previous episodes, so thank you. So Mohammed's question was, how do you find the sweet spot um, maintaining ride height and grip? So I guess on cars with a lot of aerodynamic loads, um, the needs for stiff, uh, stiffer springs and dampers um, uh, go against the needs of the, the tires and managing a, a, a reasonable margin for the driver. Um, so what are the tools that are used commonly to find the best spot there? So I think you've you've talked about some of the examples already uh, in terms of the techniques that will get used within the industry to to, to try and uh, tune this behaviour. I don't think there's there's one particular sort of one size fits all solution. Uh, we've uh, you've touched a little bit on vehicle simulation, and that's certainly good for um, sort of ploughing through all of the uh, available options that you know ways you could set up the suspension. Uh, it's kind of um, it's re clearly reliant on on good simulation correlation to uh, to data, uh, but even you know when when you do a rig test of the and use all the correct components and and put the car on on the rig with uh, with the right tires on, it's not obvious that the correlation in that instance is is particularly that much better than you might arrive at through simulation. Uh, and then you've obviously got all the practicalities of uh, changing physical components on the car rather than just a few numbers in, in the computer to, uh, to to test a different case. Uh, I think key to, key to that and also to, to any kind of on-track testing is the metrics that you're using to, to make evaluations and make comparisons between, uh, between different scenarios. Mm -hmm. Because it's it's not obvious that there's there are too many cases where the ride is going to improve in a in a global sense uh, just through making one or two small tweaks on on the car performance. It's very likely that when you're tuning stiffnesses and, and dampers, you're going to make one area of the the circuit worse while while another one gets better. So it's it's largely about how you weight these different areas, what what you want to focus on. Uh, and uh, the range of tools that you have available to do it. Uh, I think the what you'll see in, in a lot of the, the cars that have a lot of aerodynamic downforce, for example, is that uh, the, the aero platform presentation uh, usually takes priority over the sort of general ride performance of the car, uh, especially in terms of like the stiffnesses that get used. Uh, in order to keep the car around around the peak of downforce, uh, and you know, not least because the 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 tracks that these cars are are using are are, are typically pretty smooth, so it's it's not like uh, unless you've got some you know big curb strikes in there, uh, you need to be running as soft as uh, some of the rally cars or uh, you know stadium trucks uh, for absorbing some of those bumps. Yeah, it, it's, it's an interesting area because the tools that you have at your disposal aren't particularly well suited to uh, just uh, to focusing in on one particular area and just turning them up until, uh, you know, the, the ride performance is, is, is now perfect. It's about it's about making little trades here and there uh, and using a, an appropriate sort of weighting scheme uh, to decide which of those directions is better and which of which of those is worse. Hmm. Okay. Um, all right. So the second question we had uh, that kind of leads on from from what we were just saying is uh, what are the limitations you see on simulation um, and the real world. And this is another um, another question which is um, no, um, 
And, and this is another question from someone who has um, submitted a, a Q&A previously, Asha Karis. So thanks again. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts on that, Mike? It, yeah, it's coronation, really. Uh, but in my experience, the, uh, the, the power of the simulation tools today kind of uh, means it's a, it's a very useful uh, mechanism for, for kind of evaluating changes before you run anything on on track uh, or even on on say a seven post rig uh, with with you know the the complexity of the simulations and the current computing power you can get through many uh, different cases and many more different cases in simulation than you're able to uh, on the rig so definitely something that's that's here to stay and something that's going to get exploited more and more uh, Obviously, cor your correlation needs to be reasonably strong. Otherwise, uh, your uh, your results are, are going to point you in the wrong direction. But the the models uh, for vertical dynamics are, can be made reasonably simple. Uh, and in my experience, getting a reasonably strong correlation uh, isn't isn't too much of a headache. And uh, you can then, uh, as I say, use this to perform, you know, many thousands of simulations if you want to in, in a reasonably short period of time. Cool. All right. And just finishing up then, uh, the last question is from the Rish Rabin 13. Um, excuse me if I've not pronounced that right. It's always hard with, with online names because there's no, you know, the, the formatting and the spacing between the, the words is, is difficult. But... Um, he asks, how do you gather and manipulate data so that you can interpret it? So I guess that's around instrumentation and um, analysis software. Yeah, so we, we touched on these a little bit earlier. I think your your key tools for ride performance are, are your uh, are your vertical accelerometers, so measurement of vertical body acceleration, uh, Either well, either mounted to the body or or even to the uh, the hubs to the um, to the to the wheel uprights, uh, so you can see you know that you can examine the frequency content within those. You know what kind of frequencies are you seeing as your car is driving around the track? Uh, you've also um, got uh, your your displacement signals through uh, you know damper displacement. Um, or, or similar, you know, in, internal suspension disp displacement. Uh, you might even have load cells uh, within the suspension that are telling you, uh, you know, how much load is uh, going through that particular corner uh, at each instant around the lap. Uh, though those are going to those are going to be very useful to you, uh, as well as finally, you know, some some cars have laser ride height measurement, uh, and that which that's particularly useful for uh, get, getting the aerodynamic at attitude of the car around the around the lap, uh, but they will also include some some ride content as well. So I think those those are your pro probably your primary mechanisms for re recovering ride data, and then obviously logging those uh, through any any standard data logger, uh, so that they can be replayed alongside the other uh, other signals like car speed, steering wheel angle. Uh, that allows you to kind of position them around the lap uh, and show you, you know, help help to kind of bolster any comments that you might be getting from the driver about uh, weak ride performance around the lap. Okay, so that wraps up our episode six of this one. Um, yeah, ride's an interesting topic. It's got a lot of um, a lot to it and is a big influencer on performance. So, hope you've enjoyed that. Thanks for joining us again. Our next episode is going to be a great one. That's going to be around what uh, vehicle dynamics would do if they had no regulations. So a bit of a creative one. We can use some imagination with this. And um, yeah, that will be coming soon. So stay tuned. Enjoy the rest of your days. Cool. So I'll stop this.